don't start to sit. So yes, a number of folks are away on holidays, uh, half term, and we have folks who are not feeling well, right guys? Um, so please uh, come on in. I'd encourage you to look at the newsletter. A um, number of things on the newsletter. One of them is going to be the Head of the Art Festival. Uh, root, um, <laughs> yes. Rosemary, uh, Ro uh, Robert, Robert, um, and you have another artist. Yeah, we've got Linda, Linda, and um, Jess. Jess, and we're going to be we'll be part of the art trail um, this year. So please keep an eye on that. Um, it's going to be, it'll be uh, good. I just want to give you some uh, encouragement as well because we'll also be talking a little bit later uh, and asking people to pray in relation to Turkey and Syria. I want to give you some encouragement. As you look around, um, we can think, well, you know, folks who are away on Sunday mornings, um, it can be a little bit uh, uh, tight. But let me tell you, compassion and love, isn't it, Claire? Bun, bun, uh, expanding at the seams with the people who want to come along. And now we've got um, the youth from Sonic Common who want to come and uh, get engaged with compassion and love as well. Um, out of what connects into that is you know that we've been praying for youth connections into uh, Chiltern Edge School. Well, we've been we've been talking with an organisation called Reach, um, and there's one that Reach and a youth leader from um, Cavisham, Emma Green, and ourselves are going to work together to see how we can support the schools. So that may possibly help uh, tie in with compassion low. Um, more information will be coming, so there's, there's, you know, there's that, there's probably on the food bank, um, there's well, more people coming along um, to the food bank, and people are engaging with the food bank. Um, so I really want you to uh, be encouraged um, and pray into what is going on throughout the week um, with, uh, with spring water. God works in small ways. I don't know if you know what's going on in the Punjab. Has anybody been heard what's going on in the Punjab, North India? So this size of group is a church in the Punjab. And it's gone from 1.2% to 12% Christians. Becoming Christians in North India, in small little groups. We can praise the Lord. But the Lord hasn't used folks like Lindsay or I or these other people. He's used all of us yourselves, like yourselves, to pray, to speak into neighbours, uh, and for people to engage um, with Jesus. It, you should find out what's going on there, it's amazing. Uh, and it's all in villages, not towns. It's in villages, small little settings like we are. Uh, God is good, God is able. I ask you um, if you would think of some psalms, and there'd be an opportunity during the worship for uh, us to speak out a psalm. But one psalm, I'll mention one, uh, Psalm 100. It says, Shout for joy to the Lord. All you worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love is yours forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Sometimes it can be difficult to be thankful. And we're thinking of Turkey and Syria. And there are Christians in Turkey and Syria who are working and helping um, young people, families, who have seen what's happened in the earthquake. Boys, any, anybody down there, as well as the adults? Can you tell me, or imagine, what an earthquake sounds like? What does an earthquake sound like, guys? Girls? Any idea? What? Boom. Boom? What would you say? Did you say boom as well? Yeah, boom. Oh, yes, that's good. It is. Lindsay and I lived through an earthquake. We were sleeping one night. And we woke up. Did you know what it sounded like? It sounded like a train coming through the house. 
massive train. And we were wondering, where is this train We're in the flat? It was pouring in. It only lasted a couple of seconds. Well, I think it was about a minute for us. This lasted two minutes. If you'd like to give, Christine A, we've got people <coughs> on the ground. Please, please, please think of giving through Christian aid. And I know the young people are going out through the woods in a minute. Is that right? On a forest walk. Do you know what also happens in a, in a, sometimes in a hurricane? And an earthquake? I've also been in an area where, where a hurricane has come through. And boats that were on the water are suddenly up in the trees. Houses that were there in an earthquake are suddenly not there anymore. Let's pray, 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 please, into this um, situation. Let's give to Christian Aid. I'm going to pray for us. We were able as well, uh, as a church, um, to give at least four big bags of clothes, of, of coats, to um, an organization that helps um, asylum seekers in Reading who have nothing. And if you have any coats that you don't need, please send them to us. You can't go to Syria, but there are people on our doorstep that we can help as well. We're going to sing a song, 10,000 Reasons. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. We sing it here, in a very um, civilized, nice environment, where there are people singing it. In countries where there is disruption, dis disruption. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you that you are our strength. You are our hope. I thank you that in the area where we are living, and I know each of us has um, challenges and difficulties that we walk through, but we thank you that you are the one who walks with us who guides us, leads us. Help us now, Father, as we worship and praise you. For you are worthy. You are worthy. For honour, glory and praise. And as we sing these songs, Father, we want it to link in and resonate with our brothers and sisters in Syria and in Turkey. Your hands on the ground, Father, helping those in desperate need. In Jesus' name I pray.
church, as it's called. Okay, Ruth, I pray for you all. Father, we lift our children to you and we lift the families to you. We ask for your eyes to rest upon them, to strengthen them and keep them safe. May this half term, Father, be a time of deep, deep enjoyment for them and for the families. Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit brings transformation in adults and young so that they see the reality of Jesus. I pray that for each of our children here, and maybe each of the children that we know, Father, in different places, different families that we're connected with, that you would come and just rest your grace and love upon us. Jesus, you threw your arms open for children as they walk through the woods this morning. As they see different aspects of your creation, may you speak into their lives your love, your comfort, your care, your support. And you would give them deep, deep, deep shalom. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to be having communion as well in a little while. Um, we're going to carry on worship in Christ alone. And there'll be times in between, you saw the newsletter, there'll be times in between where we'll be able to speak out a psalm or a praise or a word of thanks to God.
you have a song or a word that you'd like to speak out, shout for joy to the Lord, all of you. Worship the Lord with gladness and before him with joyful song. celebrate the life that Jesus has shared among his community throughout the centuries and shares with us now. Made one in Christ and one with each other, we offer these gifts and with them ourselves a single holy living sacrifice. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me shall not hunger, and all who believe in me shall not thirst. With Christians around the world and throughout the centuries, we gather around these symbols of bread and wine, simple elements that speak of nourishment and transformation. <coughs> Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you are as close to us as breath, that your love is constant and unfailing. We thank you for all that sustains life and especially for Jesus Christ, who teaches us how to live out an ethic of justice and peace and for the promise of transformation made manifest in his life, death, and resurrection. 
we ask you to bless this bread and this cup. Through this meal, make us the body of Christ, that we may join with you in promoting the well-being of all creation. Amen. We remember on the night when Jesus and the disciples had their last meal together. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat it, and as often as you do, remember me. The bread will now be distributed, and uh, if you'd like to eat it as you receive it. Thank you. In the symbol of the broken bread, we participate in the life of Christ and dedicate ourselves to being his disciples. In the same way, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to the disciples saying, drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The wine will now be distributed, and when you receive it, just hang on to it, and we'll drink together. In the symbol of the cup, we participate in the new life Christ brings. The blood of Christ. <coughs> Let us pray. We give thanks, loving God, that you have refreshed us at your table. <coughs> Strengthen our faith. Increase our love for one another. As we have been fed by the seed that became grain and then became bread, <coughs> may we go out into the world to plant seeds of justice, transformation and hope. Amen.
Father, come, I pray. Let your spirit rest upon Lindsay, but also on us. We seek to be transformed and renewed, to be more like this Jesus that we've remembered this morning. The one who gives us hope now and for eternity. Oh, Father, for your kingdom to come, your will to be done in our streets and towns and villages and shops, so that people would taste and see the reality and the love of Jesus. I can do this in pray. In Jesus' name. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Some of you observant ones will have noticed this. I'll just leave it there for now. Um, so, as you know, we're in the middle of a series, right up until Easter, where we're looking at God's church. Um, in out shaped all about. So I heard a little voice at the back say, are we going to do the hokey pokey? And I said yes to Enid, who's hiding. Yes, you're coming up to demonstrate. No, we're not going to do the hokey pokey, and neither am I going to talk about the hokey pokey. But it's a phrase that came to me as I was preparing this, this morning, um, during the week. <coughs> we're talking about the church. God's church. So the series that we've been doing, Kevin started it off about three weeks ago, looking at what we are as followers of Jesus. We've got three main focuses, what we are as followers of Jesus, why we are a church, and how do we live out being Jesus in the world where God has placed us. But today, I want to take us back to basics, so that we're all on the same page when we talk about church, because the chances are there's a whole lot of different views of what church is. So what is church? What do we think about when we think about church? I grew up thinking that church was what we did on a Sunday. For me, it started at 9.30 in the morning with helping at Sunday school. Then we had the breaking of the bread. I went to a brethren church in those days for a 90-minute service. Then we went home for lunch, and then I was back at church in the afternoon at 3 o'clock for a Bible class, 4.30 for a band practice, 6.30 for a gospel service, and 8 o'clock for a youth group. And then I wondered why I was tired on Monday morning. Church for, me, uh, some, church for me meant a lot of work on a Sunday. It's what I did and it's where I went on a Sunday. The first time we see the word church used in the New Testament is actually Jesus telling Peter that he's the rock on which he's going to build his church and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. We sang that song last week. So Matthew 16, we're not going to look, I'm not going to put that passage up because it's not the one I want to focus on today. I'm actually going to be looking at the first two verses of 1 Corinthians. But this is an important passage as a foundation. They're standing near Mount Zion. Oh, I always forget to do the slides. That was my picture for what you think of when you think of church. A big building, spring water. And I think it was Robin Mills who did that picture, wasn't it? To symbolise spring water. They're standing near Mount Zion, which that's a modern day picture from one of the sides of the, of the mountain, but it was a very rocky mountain and Jerusalem was, the temple in Jerusalem was built on it. Jesus was very visual. He would look around when he was, was trying to teach something and he would pick, pick something that he could see around him, just like Judy, Judy's great message last week. He always used images that were right there in front of him. <clears throat> and he's asking his followers, who do people say that I am? And his followers, they say, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say one of the prophets. And he says, yes, but who do you say that I am? And Simon, who we know as Peter, but at this point in the story he was called Simon, says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, Wow, well done. Blessed are you, Simon. You are now going to be called Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But what does all that mean? How is Peter the rock on which the church is built? I thought Christ was the rock, the cornerstone. What prompted Jesus to say this to Peter is what Peter said. It's his proclamation of who Jesus is. That's the rock on which the church needs to be built, that Jesus is going to build his church on. Peter's task is to keep the church true to its mission, to proclaim the name of Jesus, 
to proclaim that Jesus is Lord, the Messiah, the Saviour. And if you read on in that chapter, the very next story is Jesus is telling all his followers that he's going to go to, they're going to Jerusalem and he's going to die and he's going to rise again. And Peter says, no, 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 that's not going to happen. You can't, that can't possibly happen. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. Really strongly, he says, uh, don't get in the way of what God is doing. So it's really important to Jesus that what Peter is true to is the proclamation of who he is. And that means everything he does, everything he says. And what else does he say? He says, the gates of hell, gates of Hades, whichever translation you look at, will not prevail against it. Basically, Jesus is saying, whatever the enemy throws at the church, it will survive. And I think in this day and age, we need to know that. We need to believe Jesus, because it's an interesting time at the moment for the church, the worldwide church. It's a promise we must cling on to. When we hear the church of God is dying, and we heard that plenty when we lived in America, didn't we? In European churches dying, they would say, it is not. It's beginning to look different, but it's not dying. It will not die. Jesus promised that. Do we believe him? And it needs to look different. We're in a very different world now to what we were 50 years ago. We're definitely in a different world to what, we, what the early church looked like. For a start, we don't speak Greek or Latin to each other, do we? Which they all did, or Aramaic. The style has changed. But it's also a very different world to be proclaiming the name of Jesus in, isn't it? To what it was 50 years ago. It's a much more secular world. Now far fewer people identify as Christian. And many would see the church as archaic and out of date, unloving and judgmental. But the bottom line is, the church always needs to proclaim the name of Jesus. If you look at our vision and our values on the website, that's what we aim to do here at Springwater. So you might be wondering what the title In, Out, Shake It All About has got to do with any of this. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians. The first two verses of chapter 1, the very start of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, it's actually a really interesting letter about church and I had been reading it for a few weeks thinking oh my goodness I would love to do a teaching series on this whole book there is so much in it that's really challenging and then when as a leadership team we were talking about what we wanted to do uh, for the sit next series uh, we talked about doing about church and trying to get understand what church is and Grace said she'd been reading the same book the same letter um, and pointed us to these first two verses so I thought that's a great place for us to start. So, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 2. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those in every place, who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. And then. There's a little bit that comes after, but I'll share that at the very end. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Basically, this is just Paul telling the Corinthians who he is and why he can write this letter to them. Because it's going to be a pretty hard-hitting letter. They're not going to like a lot of it. And he's telling them this because he had founded that church in Corinth. He's reminding them he is one of the apostles. He wasn't one of the apostles that were with Jesus physically, but he did meet Jesus face to face, which is what gives him the right to call himself an apostle. But he has a bittersweet relationship with this church because they are just a little bit big for their boots. Corinth was one of those cities that really looked down on everywhere else. There was a lot of money, a lot of wealth, a lot of trading, and the church was beginning to take on that same attitude of, well, we know what we're doing, the rest of you don't. They were getting a bit big for their boots, and they were beginning not to listen to him. The reason he mentions this person, Sosthenes, try saying that fast, he's with Paul as he writes it. Paul is actually in Ephesus when he writes it, and he's known to the Corinthians. So again, Paul is saying, listen to what I've got to say. He's just validating and giving credibility to his right to say what he's going to say to them in this letter. The next thing he says, to the church of God that is in Corinth. 
To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at that word church. It's the same word Jesus uses when he's talking to Peter. But like with all words, you have to dig in to get the real meaning. And like with all words, you have to know what was meant by that word when it was first used. So if I was to read something written in the 1300s hundreds about a nice man, I'd be really shocked when I read this nice man was stupid and ignorant. Ignorant, But that's what nice used to mean. I didn't know that. I found that out this week. Did you also know what the original meaning of the word bully was? I could pretty much guarantee no one will guess that unless they've done the same research that I did. It used to mean sweetheart. <laughs> you wouldn't know that, would you? <coughs> so we have to go back to what it meant for Paul or Jesus, in, in the cases we've looked at this morning, what they meant when they used that word. And it didn't mean a church. It meant those, literally it meant, those called out of their homes where they were comfortable for assembly, for gathering. It was used for all sorts of meetings. It was used for civic meetings. It was used when it was a gathering of unrest. It's used for that in Acts, when, there's the, when the crowd is, is uh, when there's a riot, it's used then. It's also used for groups of volunteers getting together. But the key thing is, it's used for, when they are, I'll go back again. It's used for a group of people coming out of their comfort into a gathering with the same purpose. And so you can see how gradually that became, gradually to become the word church. What it really meant was community. And I think that's a fantastic word for church, community. Coming together in unity. When we first came back from America, Kevin and I used that word quite a lot to describe what we were in Springwater. And a few people resisted it, saying that's so American. It's not American, it's totally biblical, as I found out this week. That's really what that meaning of ecclesia is, community, coming together unity. It's a rich word. And if we follow on from what Jesus said to Peter, it's a gathering, a community of people who are committed to proclaiming Jesus as Lord. So Paul said, carries on to the church of God that is in Corinth. Called to the community of God in Corinth. But he's reminding them they are the church of God, not the church of Corinth. They are the church of God. The church belongs to God. We have to keep remembering that it's God's church, not our church. It's God's community. Let's not forget we are the church of God, not the church of spring water. To those who are sanctified, sorry, I was good behind. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. I don't know about any of you who grew up hearing this word sanctified. I used to hate it. I think actually I don't really like it even now. Because it always reminds me of sanctimoniousness and piety. It always reminds me of this sort of idea that you've got to behave in a certain way to be a Christian. Um, and that can cover up an awful lot of stuff that's going on inside you. It's just a facade that you can put on. And God's pretty pretty scathing about this sort of attitude. With lots of lots of chapters in, in the whole Bible where he's, he really comes down on people like that. But that's not what sanctified means. What sanctified means is set apart, but not set apart in superiority, set apart with the sole purpose of being dedicated to God's will, to God's mission. So it's much more about being God's witness than it is about behaving nicely. I'm so glad about that, because I don't think piety draws people to Jesus. I think it pushes them away, in fact. So the church is called to be holy. It's called to be set apart. A little bit, bit like um, one of the commentators, N.T. Wright, talks about a suit that he puts to one side, and it just comes out for special occasions. <laughs> he uses that as an analogy. But it's not with any sense of status that I'm better than you. It's purely in context of being God's witness. And just in case we think it's all about us being good, it's in Christ. We have to remember 
It is in Christ, sanctified in Christ Jesus. It's nothing to do with what we do or have done. It's all to do with what Jesus has done. And this next part in the scripture is crucially important as well. Together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Calling upon the name of Jesus, basically that means recognizing who he is, worshiping him, focusing on him, calling out his name to the world. So proclaiming him back to what Jesus, what Jesus said to Peter. And it puts us in our place. We are part of the worldwide church. As Kevin often says, when God looks down on Pepin and Son in common, he doesn't see the three Anglican churches and the free church and the Catholic church and Springwater. He sees one church, his church. What might that look like? Well, next week, I'm going to carry, carry this on and I'm, and I'm going to be looking at the church as the body of Christ, which is a really fun analogy for the church. Challenging, but fun. So, just a quick summary. We are a community of people who are committed to proclaiming Jesus as Lord. We are God's community. We are dedicated to show God's way. It's because of what Jesus has done and who he is. And we're part of a much bigger whole. So let's go back to the idea of in, out, shake it all about. There are a lot of analogies about church that talk about movement and travel and journeys. And I don't know if some of you might remember, during lockdown, Chris Mitchell did a sermon on the church as rather than a stagnant lake or pond, a river. It's always movement, always movement, going somewhere. Because when we become too settled and too comfortable, we lose sight of God and his mission. And in the end, church becomes our idol. And we worship church and not God. So it becomes much more about what we want from church rather than God's mission. The church is in the middle of quite a painful time. It's in the middle of a, para a massive paradigm shift. This happens every 500 years or so, and many people believe we're right in the middle of one now. And that makes it uncomfortable for many of us. COVID rocked it and all the discussions about should we wear masks, should we not, and social distancing and lockdown. There's lots of difficult conversations going on in the media that are rocking the church. Spring water itself has gone through an upheaval, culminating in the loss of two families at the end of last year. And many of us are grieving that loss still and praying for those who left as well as those left behind. Loss is painful. But we have a choice. Do we focus on the loss or do we focus on Jesus and the calling he has given us? We acknowledge the loss, that's really important, and we honour those who left. And we try to do that by asking, raising money to give them a gift so that we can thank them for all they've done. <coughs> but we need to keep moving forward, trusting that God knows what he is doing. Let's go back to where I started. The first time the word church was used by Jesus to Peter the rock on which he was going to build his church. I've already said what that rock was. It wasn't Peter. It was proclaiming the name of Jesus recognizing who Jesus is, the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who gave his life for the whole world. Proclaiming that. And I looked up the word proclaim to see what it means in all the ways it's used in the Bible, and pretty much every single time, there's a couple, but 99% of the time, it's outside the church, not inside the church, that, it's, that the word proclaim is used. So we are called Ecclesia, out of our comfortable homes to be part of the community. Called out to be those who call upon the name of Jesus. Have we made the rock on which Jesus built his church, is it still the proclamation of the name of Jesus? Or as I said before, has the rock become the church itself? A few months before COVID hit, I think it was about in the October, Kevin and I were at uh, Transform Reading and I had a picture that I felt was to do with the, the whole church, specifically in Reading, but I think it applies to the whole church everywhere. The actual picture was of a yellow brick, a, a church made up of build, yellow building blocks, just like the, the kind that children you play with. 
I was actually going to demonstrate the vision, to the picture today, and then Kevin pointed out that with the earthquake in Turkey, that would have been way too cross and insensitive. So I'm going to sort of do a... I didn't say that. He didn't say cross and insensitive. No, he didn't. But he highlighted very nicely. I was so glad he mentioned it, because I might have thought of it suddenly now, and you'd have been all bit wondering why there was a church made up of yellow building blocks on that table. But I want to do something that still gives the same impression. Because in that picture, God was saying, he, he, the picture was in this yellow church of building blocks. And God was saying, my church has become too comfortable and too settled. And I'm going to do something that will shake it up. So you have to imagine the church that was built. And God is saying, I'm going to do something that will shake it up. I don't know that it was fun for God talking about shaking up his church I don't think it's what he wants to do but sometimes he needs to I felt like God was saying that is what I need to do to my church my glory, hence the yellow the yellow bricks it needs to be shaken up and sent out it cannot stay inside these four walls and he's doing that with the whole church he's not just doing that with spring water he wants to do it with the whole of his church. So ecclesia, that word for church, is a fantastic word because it starts off by being called out of your home that's safe into the community with one purpose, to proclaim Jesus as Lord. But it doesn't stop there because we are called out of that place, the comfortable church that we might be in, into the world with that message of Jesus. Because the church has become so much about the gathering, Jesus is having to say to us all, come out from that home, the church, and get on with my purposes. He's having to remind us we need to be getting out from what is comfortable. Both have to go together. Because without the sense of being invited into the community of Jesus, we have no foundation then to be called out. And the call on God's church is now to be called out of the four walls of our buildings into the world. He wants to shake up his church because we've become too comfortable and we've identified too much with the culture of church than we have with him and his, than we have with him and his mission. And he calls us into the church in order to go out, into the body of Christ, which as I say we'll chat about next week, to live out in order to go out and live out the message of Jesus wherever we are. And that has needed a shake up. called out of our homes into God's community and called out of that community into the world. We are called out to be called out. Let's add to this list, remind ourselves what Jesus said to Peter. Whatever we think about the church, it will survive. That's what Jesus promised and we believe him. So as I said, if you're concerned that the church is dying because it's changing so radically, Believe what Jesus says. Nothing can stop it. Whatever the enemy tries to throw at it, it cannot stop it. It might be changing, but so long as we stay on the rock of proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And in the midst of the major discussions that are going on at the moment, which none of us can now ignore, we mustn't forget what the central message of the gospel is to proclaim, proclaim Jesus as Lord and Saviour. We are called out to be called out. A community of people who are committed to proclaiming Jesus as Lord. God's community. Dedicated to show God's way. It's because of what Jesus has done. Nothing to do with what we've done. It's part of a much bigger whole. It's called out to be called out. And Jesus promised that it will last. Just to end with, I'm going to read the passage adapted from the message, the passage that we've read. I'm going to adapt it from the message as a blessing to us all. To God's church in spring water, believers cleaned up by Jesus and set apart for a God-filled life. I include in my greeting all who call out to Jesus wherever they live, in South Oxfordshire, England, UK, the USA, South Africa, wherever else might be represented by all of us here. He's there, Canada. 
He's their master as well as ours. May all the gifts and the benefits that come from God our Father and the Master, Jesus Christ, be yours. Or as the more traditional translation says, which some of you might remember, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll be praying for those in Turkey, in Syria, for the church that is sprinkled throughout that region. And remember, that is a region where the church initially grew, where it first came into being. It's a lovely picture there. So we're going to pray, uh, we're also going to pray for folks that we know who need prayer. I should pray for Lindsay. She heard this morning that her mum is ill. Um, and they're sleeping, so she doesn't know whether her mum's in hospital or whether um, she was able to uh, uh, get better. And I ask to pray. We'll have a time, um, we'll have a song at the end, but if people need prayer as well, for anything, there'll be some confidence to walk out to the next door neighbour. Let's pray for you. Get some oil, we'll be happy to anoint you or get your friends by the side of you. Uh, pray. But let's just spend time now reflecting on what Lindsay said <coughs> and pray. And I'll highlight some points as we spend time a quiet together, listening to the Lord. Because the other brilliant thing is when that gets sprinkled out, the Holy Spirit has gone before. And it goes before you. Empowering you, empowering me, wherever we walk. The kingdom of God flowing as we pray now for individuals. The Lord is in our prayer. Father, as we spend time before you now, contemplating as your Holy Spirit touches our hearts and minds. Father, we want to bring to you people in troubled lands father this picture that Lindsay has shown for your church is growing in Punjab father be with your brothers and sisters be with our brothers and sisters your people in that place right across North India may the light of your light shine father God. same in China and other places father. You would taste and see how good you are. You would go before all of these individuals, Father. Let me pray for some of those places that are on your heart at the moment. Could be a street, could be a neighbor, could be a village, could be another country. Maybe those calling you out to engage more fully. With those that are on your heart in the moment. Just think of those in Turkey and Syria. We know there are Christians living there. We know that Christian aid and others are engaged on the ground. Not just Christians, but a whole uh, sway of relief organizations. Pray for the Lord, His power and presence to step into that place. Mourning with those who mourn. Comforting those who need comfort. Think of folks closer to home. Dave and Grace. Julie, a friend of the brain. Many of us, and Lindsay and I included, and many of us are in pastoral relationships with individuals who need a special touch of the Lord in their life. Whether it's to bring peace, shalom, healing. Pray for those people you know that you may be walking with, who God has connected you to.
So I want to pray for the young man who was willing to going to come to uh, worship but wasn't able to come. Pray for his family. Maybe speak out some of those that are on your heart at the moment. Let their voice be the Lord. Let your voice be the Lord again. Father, I ask you to be with each one of us individually. You know what's going on in our lives, our minds, our hearts. So thank you that you have sent your counsel of the Holy Spirit to speak truth and life into our lives. As we go from here, Father God, may we walk in that truth. And give us boldness where we need it, humility where we need it, grace where we need it, peace where we need it, a voice and also silence when we need it. So that in all things people will see the reality of Jesus. Trust in you alone.
this morning together. I thank you for the offering and the gifts that you give to us. Father, we know that you...